good evening, everyone. It's really nice to see that so many people is interested in astronomy in a Friday evening. So thank you all for coming. And so today I would like to, to share with you how to search for hidden walls in, in our galaxy. So the idea of the talk, I think, is not that I just speak alone and you listen to me, but I would like to have this a bit interactive. So feel free to ask me questions at any point of the talk. And in case you feel shy, I will also ask you questions. So I would really like if you try to, to answer me. It's not so much about being right or wrong, but also I would like to see how much you, you know on, astro on astronomy and which are your guesses. So yeah, so this is um, how it would like to be uh, our evening together. And so I will start by, by presenting myself and introducing myself. I did my, my bachelor in masters in, in, at the University of Barcelona. And for my thesis, I got interested in studying young uh, stellar associations. So um, uh, these are basically groups of young stars that are very near by the sun. And this gave me um, the knowledge to afterwards pursue a, a PhD position in France, this time in Bordeaux, where I, where I, in this case, I continued to study very young stars, but I was more focused in understanding how these stars form, and especially in finding very, very uh, low mass stars and binding them with planets as we shall see today. So this, for this PhD, I was um, awarded with an European prize from the Astronomical uh, Society and this is the work I would like to share with you uh, today. And finally, I recently moved to here in Vienna to do my, my first postdoc and where I continue to study about uh, star formation. So before starting with the science that you all came to hear today, I would like to address a question that I get asked many times for my relatives and friends whenever I say, yes, well, I do astrophysics and I work at the university. So many people is confused about what we actually do. So I would like to, to address this briefly uh, today also. So, researchers, we do many things. Uh, the first and most important, you probably guess, is we do research, yes. And in, in case of um, astronomy, this basically means two, two big important things. So, we try to observe the skies. We um, take our best instruments to point at different directions in the sky and collect as much light as possible to try to see the farthest stars, the faintest objects. Um, but this alone wouldn't be uh, enough. Then we have also uh, to build models of our galaxy and the universe in which we live. And in these models, we put all uh, the physics knowledge and all the mathematic knowledge that we have. And this helps us to explain uh, the observations that we have. And one without the other wouldn't make much sense, right? Because if we have the best model of our galaxy, but this is not validated by our, our observations, this is probably a a useless model, whilst if well, we have great observations but no model to explain them, then we will know little about the place where we live. So these things uh, work together. Me personally, I work more on the observational side, but for sure I'm constantly interacting with colleagues who might know more uh, about models. Then another thing we do as research is we continue learning always. So this is not true that once we finish our master or our PhD, we already know everything in our topic. This is completely not true. Uh, on the contrary, we continue to learn from our colleagues by reading their articles or attending to international conferences where they would present their works. And we do the same. And this is how we try to keep updated with the latest uh, research that, that our colleagues are doing. Then also some of us do some teaching duties at the university, specifically at this uh, room where we are sitting uh, now. Mo many bachelor and master courses take place. And finally, also we do some research activities like this talk today where we try to uh, 
put closer the, the work that we do the rest of our time to the society in general and we can do this either like with talks, uh, with um, collaborating with media, writing more um, divulgative blogs or in the case of astronomy also we have sometimes uh, access to, to small telescopes where you uh, and the population in general can, can look through telescopes and, and this is really nice. Okay, so after this uh, short introduction, let's move to the topic that brought you all here today. And I would like to start by setting very um, basic definitions, to, but to make sure that, that we all have the same concepts in mind and, and so that you can follow the, the talk I will be giving. So I would like to start by asking what is a star? Does anyone wants to try to answer this question? Yes, please. Exactly. That's a really good uh, answer. We're starting well. And I will ask also, I, I will repeat uh, what, he, what he said. I will also, yes. Small, yeah, also, also, also related. Are, um, anyone else wanted to, yes, please. Also, a very important. You are touching. You are all touching very important parts of of this definition. I will now ask even an easier question. I uh, I hope you all know the answer to this one. So, which is the closest star to us? Good. Okay. So our sun. This is the closest star and the one we know the best because it's so close that we can have a level of information that we cannot pretend to have with any other star that it's much farther away. And the, the important part, so uh, we could spend uh, lines and lines describing what is a star, but if we really need two bullet points to understand the talk today, are those two. So a star is a sphere of, of plasma, of gas, that is compact by gravity. So gravity is what makes uh, this gas and plasma stay together and not uh, disperse into the rest of galaxy. And then the other important property is the reason why stars shine and we are able to see them. And this is because the interiors are really, really hot and constantly nuclear reactions are ongoing and the power of these nuclear reactions arrives to us in the form of light. Okay, so this is what star is, but we are interested in lighter objects, which are planets. So how do we go from stars to planets? Basically, the main difference is that we are going to smaller, smaller objects every time. And this also means cooler objects, as we shall see uh, later on the talk. So we take first as reference our, our sun. This is for sure no, not one of the biggest stars. In fact, it's an intermediate normal star, but we can also consider uh, lighter stars, smaller stars. And when we continue to uh, go in this direction of uh, lowest mass objects, we get to a regime where stars cannot hold uh, hydrogen nuclear reactions, but they can still hold other kinds of nuclear reactions. We call this type of objects brown dwarfs. Those are a bit of a forgotten type of objects because usually we tend to speak either of stars or planets, but they are there. They are not so important for, for the talk today. And if we continue still to go to even lighter objects to these brown dwarfs, then we enter in the finally in the planetary regime. And basically what distinguishes planets from these uh, brown dwarfs and stars is that planets are not massive enough to hold any type of nuclear reactions. Okay, so they are also um, uh, spheric uh, objects, mainly the big ones, mainly also made of gas, but the difference is that they don't have nuclear reactions. But today we will talk about a very particular uh, type of planet. Um, so one characteristic is what we have already discussed, that they are 
very light. In fact, they have at maximum 13 times the size of our Jupiter. But the second important characteristic of the planets we will be discussing today is that they are not orbiting a star. They differ to the planets in our solar system or the majority of exoplanets that we know in the sense that they are not bound to any other star. And instead, you have to imagine just that they are just like the rest of stars. They are roaming around the galaxy. And those stars were discovered relatively recently, and in fact, they have many, many different names. So we can refer them as rock planet, or interstellar, nomad planets, or fun starless, wandering, free floating. All this refers to this fact that they are planetary mass objects, but uh, not bound to, to, to a sun or a star. And as you can imagine, these are extremely faint and therefore very hard to detect. We will only be able to observe these rock planets that are very close to us, where, where they are still relatively bright. Okay, so I have my second question for you. So why do you think that rock planets shine? So we said that stars shine because of these nuclear reactions, but rock planets don't have nuclear reactions. So is there any guess what they would... Okay, maybe you, let's... That's a good idea, and it's, I guess, related to the fact that why planets in our solar system shine, right? So uh, why the reason why we see uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and so, it's not because they intrinsically emit light. They emit some kind of light, but it's very, very few. The reason why we see them is because they reflect the solar light. So maybe one could think of a comparison with the galaxy, but no, this is not the reason why we see uh, rock planets. Yep, we have. Sorry? This is not the case either. No? Yep. We are getting towards the the right answer. So indeed we see them in the on the on the infrared. Yeah? <laughs> Now we are getting to the right answer, indeed. So these, these planets, uh, th what happens with them is that since they don't have nuclear reactions that sustain gravity, they are slowly contracting little by little and they are losing energy in this contraction. So the energy they lose, they radiate away and this is the source of light. And in fact, we will see later in the talk that because of the the temperature of these objects, they don't shine in the optical, but, but in the infrared. Good, so I see that the level is really high in this room. So this is basically what, what we were saying, right? So they, they contract, so um, they, this is what gives them energy, and there is a related uh, consequence of this. So every time they contract, they have less and less energy, and this means that Little by little, they fade away. So they then they are brighter when they are younger. So if we want to observe um, rock planets, it's best to observe them when they are very young because they will still be relatively bright. Yes? Okay, so now here I'm showing you an important property of stars and planets, and it's that they have they have color. So here you are seeing the, the constellation of Orion. Many of you might be able to recognize this is a very important constellation now in fall winter. It is when it's best observable. And clearly there is one star that appears to be more reddish than, than the rest. If, if you don't trust me, you can just go out and you will see this with, with the naked eye. It, it's already possible to, to distinguish these different colors. 
If you want even another example, now we can move to a constellation that is best observed in summer. Uh, so now it's already too late for seeing them, but it's the, the Cygnus constellation. So the head of Cygnus is the, the, the Nep star, which forms the summer triangle with Vega, the Nep, and Altair. And so if we take this Cygnus, uh, Cygnus at the end of the, at the tail of this um, constellation, we have this um, star, which is called Albireo. If you look at the sky in summer, this is not a particularly bright. This is a star that you can see the naked eye, but in principle, nothing super special. One would think that there should be something special about this star. However, if you take already a small uh, telescope or some binoculars, you would immediately see that this is in fact not one star, but two stars. And this is a really good example where to prove yourself that stars indeed have colors because those two stars are so close together that it's easy then to, to distinguish the, the two colors one next to the other. So stars have colors, and now would you uh, be able, I, I think this question is, is really easy for the level I have seen in the room, but anyone wants to tell me which is the hottest and which is the coolest star? Okay, yeah. The blue one is the hottest or the coolest? The hottest, indeed. So the blue star is way hotter than the red one. And I have also put the solar temperature for reference. You would see that it approaches uh, way more to the, to the cool star than not uh, to the hot one. OK, so stars have colors. But how do we measure those colors? How do we measure these colors? So basically, here what you are seeing is the amount of radiation that stars emit as a function of wavelength. So for, for instance, here we have very energetic radiation, very um, ultraviolet X-ray radiation, while here we have very low energetic radiation, we have the infrared, the radio emission. And we have uh, sources at different temperatures. So what we do to measure the colors of stars is imagine we have a detector that only collects light at a certain wavelength. Imagine that we define a blue filter that collects light only in this, in this uh, area that I have indicated. And imagine then that we define a second filter, which we call the red filter, that only collects light in this range. So then what we can do is uh, compare the light that we receive at both different filters, and this will give us an idea of the color. For instance, if we take this very hot star and, in, and we sum all the light that is received in this area, we sum all this area and compare it with this smaller area, we see that a lot more light is emitted in this blue filter, right? Then if we do exactly the same exercise with a very uh, cool star, we will see that this is almost um, zero. And on the contrary, the emission on the red is a bit higher. So this defines us a scale of colors that we can directly relate to the temperatures of the stars. And this is how we know uh, the color and temperature of stars. OK. So which is the color of rock planets? So this question doesn't make much sense now because our colleague already got to the right answer. And the answer is that these rock planets shine, in fact, in the, in the infrared. So here what we are seeing uh, is the spectra of the sun and the spectra of our Earth, if we could go out from it and, and collect the light that it emits. So first, we look again at the sun. This is the amount of radiation received at different wavelengths. And we see that the sun emits the most of uh, its light on the optical, and particularly in green. The green color is, is the one that emits more the sun. Then, um, at, at, at the site, we see that the Earth emits first way less emission in, in, than the Sun. This is because uh, it's way, way cooler. But it's not just that it emits less radiation, but the peak of this emission is shifted towards 
less energetic radiation, that's to say uh, infrared radiation. And this is exactly the same what happens with these rock planets that, that we are interested in. Therefore, we want to build infrared detectors to detect these, these rock planets. And a related uh, fact, to, so if you remember, we said that these rock planets are constantly contracting and losing energy, and therefore they, they are fading away, but they are not only fading away, but also the fact that they are losing energy means that this planet will be every time cooler and cooler, and therefore they, they will change their color. They will go from um, more energetic radiation, so bluer colors, to redder and redder, so they become redder every time. Okay, so learning more general properties of stars and planets, so just to, so you know, they, they form together in, in molecular clouds, like the ones we are seeing today, uh, today in this, in this slide, sorry. Uh, and this is an important property to search for them. them. They form together and in fact, when a, uh, when a star is born, it's not born in isolation, but they, born in fam they are born in families. And stars that, and planets that are born together, they move together in the galaxy with the same motion that the, the parent gas had, right? So here you see that all these uh, yellow dots that are part of the same family somehow move together in the galaxy, while other stars have random motions and move in, in any other direction. So this helps us a lot to detect families of young stars and the planets that were born also together in this family. Therefore, we need to measure motions of stars and planets. How do we measure motions in, in astronomy? Do you have any guess? Yes? Okay, with the Doppler effect, we, could, we can measure the, the motion in the line of sight. This is a really relative to us, exactly. This is a very good point, but the strategy needed for detecting this um, motion in the line of sight requires spectroscopy. And as I will uh, explain later, this needs a lot of telescope time. So we need to collect a lot of light for this technique. And in, fa and in the end, it's, it's not very easy. Now, I, when I refer to measuring the motion, I mean mainly in the plane of the sky. So the perpendicular motion to, to the line of sight. Do you have any guess of how can we measure this motion? Yes? Okay, I'm referring to even a more, a way less simple uh, thing that, that what you're suggesting, something that was done since, yes. Exactly. So all these uh, other approaches to refine this this motion that are that it's it's giving us extra information. But the first uh, order approximation, the most simple thing to go is taking different pictures of the sky, and then we will see how one star moves with one certain stars. In fact, move faster than others. So very distant stars seem to be relatively static and fixed on um, on the sky, whilst others have have higher motions. And by taking measuring the position at different epochs, it, we can relatively easily measure measure these motions. In fact, if we if we look at um, if we measure the position constantly of all stars in the sky, what we see is something even a bit more complicated. We see that the motion is not just a linear trajectory, but we see this type of um, undulations on the sky. And 
this is because, in fact, we are seeing the superposition of two different motions, right? So first one is the intrinsic motion of the sky, what we call the proper motion, is the reason, uh, yeah, so is the, the motion of the sky on the plane. But we see a second uh, motion, which we call parallax, and this is relative to the fact that we are we as Earth are not static, but we are moving around the sun. And this motion around the sun um, is reflected on the stars eventually. This is not important for our talk, just so you know that this exists. And in fact, it gives us a lot of information on the distance of stars. But this is not necessarily for now. For now, what we care about is this proper motion, so the intrinsic motion of, of stars on the plane of the sky. And very briefly, so you might have heard about the Gaia satellite. Uh, it was launched in 2013, and since then it has been mapping the galaxy, and it has provided us with the best uh, 3D map of our galaxy, together with a lot of proper motions for almost 2 billion sources. And so this, this satellite has helped really us a lot to understand better uh, our galaxy. However, Gaia is excellent to measure the stellar content of, uh, of the... Uh, well, yeah, sorry, and before that, uh, here I have a second movie showing you again these two motions I, I was mentioning, right? So now we see this um, circular motion due to the fact that the Earth is, is moving around the Sun. So maybe I can speed it up a bit. Yeah, well, now what you see is the constellations on, on top of this, and it's interesting to see that the constellations that uh, are, it, that were pictured many, many years ago, in fact, are not physically bound because stars move completely different within these this, um, constellations. And even more now, what we are seeing is the intrinsic motion of, of these stars, right? So these, these constellations will get eventually uh, completely destroyed. So as I was saying, Gaia is excellent to, and has helped us a lot to understand better our, our galaxy. But uh, the rock planets in which we are interested today, they are too faint for Gaia and we need other telescopes to be able to detect them. And those are telescopes which are on, on Earth, at the ground, which have way bigger um, diameters of telescope, and they, help, uh, they let us collect much more light than what can Gaia do on the, on the space. And this is very important, so the bigger the telescope, the more light we can collect, and the fainter the object we can detect, basically. And so combining uh, telescopes from different places on the Earth, which have uh, diameters of uh, between 1 and 10 meters of, of, the, of diameter, uh, we can collect images that will allow us eventually to, to detect these rock planets. So here you have a comparison of an image taken from one of these telescopes on Earth and in yellow, the Gaia detection. So this is just to show us that from the ground, we can see objects fainter sometimes than what we can see from, from the space. Uh, yeah, and this is what I was saying. And this, and now I would like to do a bit more of emphasis to the challenges, the observational challenges that accompany detecting these rock planets. So first of all, they are extremely faint. So probably at the end, you are not even able to see it. Maybe from the first rows, you can see this tiny little red dot next to uh, this big star here. Uh, this is one of, this is a Jupiter mass object it's really tiny on our images, and we need the best capabilities possible in order to detect this, this dot. But it's not only a matter of detecting it, but we also need to measure how it moves on the sky, right? And just to give you an idea of the, the small motions that, that this object has, so within a whole year, the motion of this tiny red dot is of the size of a euro uh, a coin, that would be placed here in Europe and seen from New York. So we need really to detect very small displacements. So 
not only big telescopes to collect a lot of light, but also to precisely measure uh, positions. And then finally, so once we have, uh, a, a, when we can identify these, these um, rock planets, what we want to do is obtain spectroscopy. So this is a technique we use to get as much information possible uh, of a source. Basically, what we do is uh, we point our telescope to this planet and we try to disperse the light that arrives and by, by doing this, we, we obtain what we call the spectra, that's to say, the amount of radiation at different wavelengths. And this type of, of um, analysis gives a, a lot of information because we can measure even more precisely the temperature of this object, but also we can start to study the chemical composition and also even study the, the radial velocities, which is what our colleague was saying, that's to say the motion in the perpendicular line of sight. Okay, so now um, if I was boring you, is the moment to go back to the talk because we are getting to the second part of the talk where we will finally find uh, this, this these planets. So, very a very short recap of what we are uh, we have set up to now. So, we will search for these rock planets in nearby star forming regions. Nearby because they are super faint, so we want just to focus on the closest regions and star forming regions because we said that when they are the youngest is when they bright the most. Then um, we need infrared detectors because these objects are very cool. So they shine not in the optical, but in the infrared. And finally, we need not only to detect objects, but also we need to precisely measure their motions since they will move together with the rest of young stars in the same uh, star forming region. And just as a note, so the first rock planets were discovered more or less at the turn of the century, but up to now, very few are precisely known. And this is because of all the uh, observational challenges that I have uh, described up to now. Yes, please. How many are known? Ha, this is a very tricky question because in fact, so w w how, it's also related to how secure we are that this is, in fact, a rock planet. So, we say the question is, how many candidates? Uh -huh, okay. So, <laughs> candidates, I would say we have of the order of hundreds of them. Of the order of hundreds. But, hundreds. But this is about candidates because, so, to finally know that it is indeed a rock planet, we need these spectroscopic observations I was mentioning. So we need, in fact, to obtain this this kind of, of that diagram, uh, this kind of figure. And this is really, really, really challenging for these extremely cool objects. Imagine that we need only to, to get uh, a piece of this uh, figure for with worse resolution to what I'm showing here, for a single target, it takes around four hours, for instance, with the best telescope that we have on Earth, 10, 10 meter diameter. So it's really, we cannot do this for, for thousands of objects. And then it takes a while since we detect them as candidates until we can confirm that it's indeed a rock planet. It will come <laughs> in a moment. Okay, so we are getting to the interesting part. And where do we find them? So we decided to, to search for it, them in one of the closest star forming regions that we have in the solar neighborhood that is placed uh, in the constellation of uh, the Scorpion. So you might recognize also this constellation. This is best seen in, in summer. And the moon is at scale. So what we did is we focused on this upper part, the head of the scorpion, we call this upper Scorpius, and we mapped this, this area with our own images and also with all public images that were ever taken in this region. So this is a, an image of the region that, that where we've looked for these uh, rock planets. And here, 
very briefly to place yourself what you are seeing. So for instance, you see here, there is a lot of gas and dust. This is because we said that stars form within molecular clouds, right? So here inside these clouds, stars are still uh, forming, which is good news because the stars and planets will be super young, but at the same time is bad news because this uh, gas that is forming stars also blocks the light of those stars. So it's really complicated to observe stars within the cloud. At the same time, we are lucky enough to have regions where the cloud has already uh, vanished and here it's way easier to detect uh, stars. But on overall, this is the, the area that we uh, studied and we mapped first with, with our images. So now what I'm showing you is uh, an image that is a zooming in a certain part of this region that I was just describing. And now you will have to guess what do you see at the center of this image? Okay, again, from the last strokes, I think it's going to be really hard to, to see, maybe. But knowing the name of the talk, I hope you can all imagine what's at the center of this image. And it's one of these rock planets. So again, it's a tiny little red dot at the, at the center of the image. Um, what, what we have been able to, to detect, and again, detect and see that it was co-moving with the rest of, of young stars. Uh, yes. Yes, this is this is a really good observation. But I have to say you those are all galaxies. All these other uh, red things that you see in these images are not stars but but galaxies. And you can Tell, you can some of them you can already start to tell at the at the image because they are not point like sources so they are some a bit extended sources and this is the typical pattern of a galaxy and the ones you cannot tell by eye you can tell when you do the analysis of the shape that these points have we can immediately discard them as being galaxies but it's really good that you say this because Galaxies are one of the sources, the important sources of contamination in our sample. So when we say that they are candidates and not confirmed, it's because sometimes we think they are planets, but in fact they are galaxies. Red dwarfs? You mean stars? Oh, brown dwarfs? Exactly. So. To tell, to tell the difference apart, it's about, uh, ideally, we have to measure masses, right? If we know the mass, we can tell whether it's a planet or a brown dwarf. However, uh, this is a whole other topic for another talk another day. <laughs> but measuring masses is not obvious at all. We can discuss it afterwards if you want. But yeah, ideally, if you know the mass, you can say. Otherwise, it's more complicated. Okay, um, so we were on this rock planet that we found on the images, and good news, this planet is not alone in this region, but it has a lot of colleagues that we were also able to detect as uh, siblings of this, of this um, other planet. And all these red dots that you are seeing in this image are um, a rock planets from this family and we discovered about a hundred of them and therefore this constitute the largest family of, of rock planets that were discovered in the same uh, region of the sky because previously there were discovered maybe 10 here two there and and these are all from the same region and now we have much better uh, statistical knowledge on on how often these these rock planets occur Yes. Exactly. So in principle, they are all at the same distance because they all belong to this star forming region. And we, don't, we cannot easily measure the distance to the planets, but we can measure the distance to the stars. And then if we assume that they are from the same region, in principle, they are at the same distance. Yes?
It takes a PhD to do this, <laughs> but um, so the idea here is that uh, for this specific case that I'm talking about now, so we were able to collect um, 80,000 images from 18 different instruments taking over 20 years of time lapse. So this includes both observations that not myself because I was all, I, I only did the, the analysis, but my PhD supervisor had uh, a project ongoing and he did part of these observations, but we also profit other people that might also have observed the same region of the sky and after a while this, these observations are public so everyone can go to the archive, download the image and analyze. But the analysis, you have to do it yourself. So you have to do the treatment of these images to measure the positions of all the stars, the brightness, and then also compute the motions. All these is things that, that we had to do. Uh, obviously, we didn't go star by star, so we have software that, that help us in doing this process. But then there is a second step. So once you have the huge catalog of um, millions, because it's around millions of sources, which from all those are, are the planets that you're looking for. So you, you want to use both the information on the motion and on the brightness, but this, again, you cannot, so the way to go when the data sets are so big is using statistical models that take all this information into account and eventually you get uh, the list of, of members. So this is trying to um, give an overview of all the work. Um, I don't know if this is answered the question, but it's hard to summarize everything in a simple way. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is also another topic for another uh, <laughs> talk. You can get ideas for next semester. So uh, I think we don't know. We, so we believe that both are possible. In fact, in principle, both have been proved to be possible. It's not clear which is the most frequent. And for sure, we cannot say each planet by which mechanism was was um, created. We don't know. Uh, uh, for the moment, this is a topic of, of research, of active research. So, the, so this is also why it is so important to have this, this big sample because it gives us many more examples to, to investigate and to try to, for instance, one of the key uh, questions that we want to answer is which is the origin of these of this, um, guys. I personally think that it's a bit of both. So probably several mechanisms are, both mechanisms are taking place. And maybe also it depends on the mass of the planet. One is more likely than the other. Yes, but here you, um, so you expect a larger scatter of, of uh, velocities, but not so extreme that you cannot detect them as co-moving of the of, of part of the group and then you are also getting at the limits of our uh, precision in the in the velocity of these objects so for the moment i think it's really hard to tell in this sense there are however other properties that one can think uh, for instance uh, i didn't get into this but stars are formed surrounded by disks so 
if you believe that these planets were formed like stars, you would expect to find also disks around these, these um, planets. So studying, for instance, disk properties is another thing that would give you information on their origin. Or also you can think that um, some stars have uh, are part of um, binary or multiple systems. So if these properties are the same for these planets, this also indicates that they might form um, as stars. On the contrary, if you, these planets have disks, but these disks have shapes very different from what we would expect, this maybe means that during the ejection they were perturbed. And in this sense, this is what we are trying to investigate now, but the answer is we don't know yet. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> So the second question is hard to answer because it's directly related, so it correlates also with the distance. So the close, closer you are, the, the older you might get. But in the end, it, you, so you really need to go for very young objects. In this case, those are around 10 million years. 10 million years. The sun is, if I'm not mistaken, four giga years, something like this. So these are babies compared to, to the sun. Uh, and the problem is that when you start to go to older objects, then you immediately need to reduce a lot the distance in which you can observe them. So there have been observed uh, planetary mass objects older than this, but then it's really very, very close to, to us. Okay, so if there are not more questions for the moment, we were um, at this family, um, we're already getting towards the, the end of the talk, just to say that then for uh, some of them, we were able to get some uh, time at, at telescopes and I had the great chance to, to do some of these observations. And with this big spectrograph that you can see that is um, quite bigger than myself. So we, we, had, uh, we could point to some of these targets and get this, this type of spectra I'm showing you here to confirm that, in fact, uh, the ones we could uh, observe are indeed um, rock planets, which make us think that probably all the rest are also. And, and this is, for instance, the example I was saying to take this spectra that has relatively poor resolution compared to what we can obtain for stars this took for four hours of integration time with this huge telescope of 10 meters of diameter. So this is why it's really, really challenging to get these observe, uh, objects observed with spectroscopy. And uh, already to, to finish, so what we can think is how often are these rock planets in the galaxy, right? And so this is not uh, rocket science. Here we are playing on the extrapolation side, but we can imagine that this star forming region that we studied is no different than other regions in the galaxy. And then um, if we compare the proportion of rock planets that we form, found compared to stars, we can extrapolate this value to the entire galaxy. And we believe that there should be around uh, 10 billion of super Jupiters uh, roaming into our galaxy. So this number is really huge. And it only refers to um, planets of the size of our Jupiter or even bigger. This is because we could not detect objects like our Earth. Those are way too faint to be detected at the distance of this star forming region. But we know that um, Earth-like planets are way more frequent than Jupiter's. And therefore, again, playing on this extrapolation side, we would think that there are even more uh, Earth roaming and populating our galaxy. But the, really the take home message here is that uh, rogue planets are a common output of, of star formation and there should be many, many in our galaxy. 
And to finish, um, you probably have heard of about the GWST telescope. This was launched last Christmas, and this summer we got the first images of this telescope. This is the first image that was uh, released, in fact, and uh, also so that you get an idea of how good this telescope is, I would like to briefly compare it to the Hubble so the image we had before the GWST, you see that we gain, I will put now again GWST, and you see that we gain a lot in sensitivity and resolution. So this telescope really is, is uh, amazing. This is another example. Now it's the Hubble image, and if you look, now it's the GWST. So really we 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 get we have like new eyes on a, on our galaxy and the reason why i'm telling you all this and how do we connect this with planets is because uh, we expect that this telescope will allow us to detect uh, many new of these rock planets um, also probably we will be able to take a spectra of some of them and this will allow us to confirm that they are indeed uh, planets and also uh, to study their uh, atmospherics and all this will give us more information also on their origins. So this is my, my final slide. I would like to finish with this uh, message in which uh, rock planets are a common output of star formation. There must be many in our galaxy. And the reason why we only know very few is because they are extremely faint and challenging to, to detect. But thanks to large telescopes on Earth and the GWST, probably they have a, a bright future. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take more questions. Yes. Why do I think that more stars form than planets? Well, I think I, I would say that this is something that we are still measuring. The fraction of stars to planets, we are still unsure about this, I would say, because uh, we are only starting to measure now the, the real proportion of, of rock planets, and we might even be missing more due to our observational challenges. So I think it's hard, yeah, I think it's still under debate, the, the final fraction of star to planets. But for sure, if you consider all substellar objects and all the stellar content in terms of numbers, I, I would say there's not such a big difference. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's. This is one of the critical uh, things. First, because we don't even fully agree on the on the definition, right? So I explained this definition in terms of the mass, but not all the community agrees with this. There's people who believe that uh, the objects should be classified in terms of how they are formed, but this is on its own way also very complicated because how, how do you know how this guy was formed, right? So first we need to agree on this, but even if you decide to stick with the mass criterion, there's also then the debate on how to measure masses that is, is really complicated again. No. Yes? How long it takes? It depends. It depends because, for instance, in this case, um, we could get the observational time while we were finishing the publication. So those were confirmed right after. But for others, it might take some time and since between they are published and someone applies for telescope time and gets it, observes and publishes. So it, it I would say it depends a lot. Yes? Yeah. No, no. So, okay. 
let me see if I get this right. So you are asking me about the size of, of this area. Yes. Okay, so the solar system would be just one of these stars or one of these rock planets, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I, yes, yes. So, yes, because, so here we are not resolving systems. We are, when I call it family, I call it in terms of uh, stars or planets that were born from the same molecular cloud. But, so, each of these, Exactly. So, but each of these stars might have its own solar system, maybe. Yeah, yeah. It's a big size. <laughs> when you get to astronomical distance, everything gets. Yes? So if I remember, so you are referring, for instance, about ALMA telescopes? Ah, the Horizon Telescope. Oh, I'm not really an expert on this one. But so related to this, maybe it's true that, so I explained one technique to detect these rock planets, which is by directly observing them. There's people working on um, other detections, and this is based on using the planet as a gravitational lens. In this case, the planet, um, you have to imagine that the planet is aligned with a background star. And then um, when they are aligned, the planet um, bends the, the light of the star. And this is a way also to detect some of these rock planets. I'm not an expert on this technique more than what I just explained. I know that they can detect uh, planets, then it's not so, so they can even get to smaller masses and older planets because it's not so much about how the planet shines. But then the, the problem there is that if you after once want to go and follow up this object, it's impossible because in fact, you don't know exactly where it, the planet is. I don't know if this answers the question. Yes. I think I can answer in so many different ways. So in inside, if you ask me just on the astrophysical side for, for our colleagues, so those are important because they are a very important output of star formation. So in the, they also teach us a lot on how stars are formed because they form all together. So all I was saying about the proportion of these rock planets, the characteristics they have and their disks and all this tell us a lot about the star formation process and understanding how, how stars form is also very important to understanding how our galaxy works in, in general. So in this sense, it, they are very important also because they are probably very numerous. So it's they are relevant in the end for, for, for our galaxy. Then if you ask me more in a philosophical way, I think it's also, I mean, when I do this, it, it also gives us a lot of perspective of the amount of uh, walls that are around. So I, I find this quite, quite inspiring also. And I think it's, it's worth devoting time and efforts to this. No, well, here there's another whole story, right? And probably other people here at the Institute would be in a better position to answer. But well, I mean, in this rock planet itself, I would say no, because so on Earth, we have the, li the conditions for life because we have our sun that warms us up. And for that, we can have um, liquid water, etc., etc. These stars are alone, isolated in a sense, so no one is warming them up. So in principle, I would imagine they are really cool and not somewhere where we would like to go. <laughs> yes?
Ah, you mean uh, yeah, the gems. This one? Okay, no, but for this is none of these rock planets. This is, in fact, I think for an exoplanet. This was released with the GWST. Uh, we don't, and for for the candidates I was describing today, we don't have yet this this precision. This is something that we would like to investigate in the future, but we don't have the the data yet. I think it has been done for other rock planets. Um, But but this is not a rock planet. This is an yeah, ex yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I think it's absorbing. No, yeah. Well, I have to say I'm not a, really an expert on those diagrams, but there's a group doing exoplanets here at the Institute, and maybe they could answer you better. I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I Thank you. Yes? My understanding is that stars like Venus and red planets are created or in the same area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, so you mean about the difference between a star, a brand of, and a planet, or? Okay, so. This is a very yeah. It's it's hard because. So when you say a normal planet, I understand it as an exoplanet, because so the the idea is very general again and saving a lot of details. But you have to imagine you have a cloud that in some parts it starts to become gravitationally unstable and the gas begins to collapse, right? So in these positions, you end up forming star and depending on how massive uh, this piece of um, gas that is contracting or not, you have a more massive star or a less massive star. Okay, so we believe that in, in this uh, scenario of small uh, clumps of gas contracting, you can form uh, very small objects, even objects that uh, are be what we call below the, so that have nuclear reactions, but not hydrogen nuclear reactions. And in this case, we will call this a brown dwarf, even if it was formed by the same mechanism as a star. But it has such a low mass that it cannot burn hydrogen on its core. And in this case, we would call this a brown dwarf. So this is part of the scenario. But at the same time, you have to imagine that some of these stars that are being formed, they form a disk of gas around themselves. And within this disk, also, um, planets can form. This is how our solar system was formed, right? So planets form around the main star. And then 
it might happen that some of these stars, for some reason, get ejected from the initial system, and then this object will pass, will start being an exoplanet and will end up being one of these rock planets. Ah, well, so this can be um, either because there's um, interactions with other bodies of the same um, solar system that is being formed, or the, the planet become, uh, passes very close to the central star and gets perturbed, or you can also imagine that an external star that has nothing to do with this system passes very close to this uh, solar system that's being formed, and this generates some instabilities and perturbations that end up with the ejection of one of these planets. You're welcome. Yes. Yeah, it's not a stupid question for sure. We think that it could work both ways. I'm not sure if this has been observed though, but from the theoretical point of view, it, it would be able to work, yeah. Well, I guess in this case, you would call it back an exoplanet because at the point you, at the moment you detect it, it's part of a planetary system. But in this case, probably you would expect that this planet has very different properties than the planets in that solar system. For instance, it has a very elliptical or eccentric orbit, or the orbit is in the opposite direction of the majority of planets in this solar system. See, so these things would make you think that this was an outsider, and in fact, it's not part of the, of the planetary system. Um, yes, so also also the planets in our solar system cooled down from the moment they were born. But in this case, see, when it starts being part of a planetary system, you have other ways of detecting these sources. So the majority of uh, exoplanets that we know, it's not that we have directly observed them, but we have observed the effect that they do on the star that hosts them. For instance, when they pass by in front of the star, we see that the light of the star decreases and then increases again. And this indicates that something is constantly passing in front of this star, so probably there's a planet there. So we have other ways of detecting these, these other exoplanets. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, probably there are also a lot of planets smaller than these because we can find them up to now. But I think the mass is together for these uh, objects uh, put an amount of the, a certain amount of the dark matter. Uh, so yeah. I think it has been investigated, but the problem here is that indeed we think they are very numerous, but they are very they are among they account for very small amounts of mass. So I think on overall it's very small the percentage that you would be able to explain for this. So you still would have a problem. I think I think so, but <laughs> yeah, I'm also not an expert of on dark matter. Yes. <laughs> so you think that most of them are the first uh, rock lakes or planets are the first things that are normal in the system in the sense that there are no sort of uh, um, micro planet parts? So, so I think part of them were found in isolation and part of them were probably formed, as you explained, in a disk and afterwards were ejected. I think it's both. Which is the most frequent? I don't think we are in a position to say it yet. Yeah, I think I think this is related. Again, I'm not super um, familiar with all these theories, but of obviously, when one of the planets of a planetary system is ejected, especially a big one like a uh, super Jupiter, 
the rest of planets are somehow also perturbed and it's possible that they somehow migrate or they change their initial configuration. This is for sure, yeah. Yeah, ah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so yeah, we. Uh, 